literally thrilled to be here um, at this event, almost concluding 12 years of the life of the Nerva Center. 30. 30 yeah. <laughs> um, I really feel grateful um, to Jürgen as the head of uh, Max Planck, to Rivka and Ali that just yesterday, that means 13 years ago, called me, contacted me, and suggested me to apply for this project. And I cannot imagine my uh, intellectual life, my intellectual journey without being uh, at Minerva Center, which was really a home for me for the last 13 years. So this is an opportunity to say thanks to all those who made this uh, possible. So thank you, Rivka, thank you, Jürgen. Uh, I don't know if Adi is with us on uh, so he will get, uh, will get uh, Okay, um, I mean, I'm basically a legal theorist and part-time uh, political theorist. Uh, I'm clearly not a historian of science. So uh, my comments about, uh, about the book would be clearly partial and clearly influenced from the kind of projects that I'm engaged with. Once uh, my supervisor told me there's a saying that if you're a hammer, all you see is nails. <laughs> and given the fact that I just finished a book titled The Struggle for Autonomy, Kant's Struggle for Autonomy on the Structure of Practical Reason, and the book is basically about how do we manage, I mean, can't try to establish autonomy of spheres. The autonomy of uh, the metaphysics from theology, autonomy of issues of law and justice from ethics, questions of legitimacy from question of justice, um, which becomes sort of the motto of lots of writing after that, of the whole project of enlightenment and of modernity at large, about this purification that there is somehow internal logic to each sphere. Economy is about efficiency, aesthetics is about beauty, etc. So in many ways, I read this book um, in the light of my current project about this idea of struggle for autonomy. And on purpose, I use the word struggle, because for me, and I think for Jürgen, this is ongoing struggle. Uh, I use the word struggle that bears probably some resemblance or some connotation to Hegelian tradition that comes after Kant, uh, but definitely a struggle that is ongoing struggle that knows no moment of rest in, in, in many ways. So I wanted to read this book through three major um, uh, ideas that I think all of them are connected. And then I want to uh, actually situate uh, this book in a whole tradition. And of course, I want to um, recruit Jürgen to our side to a certain side of critical humanist uh, tradition. So I think when I read the book, I, I wanted to emphasize the three themes or words that come back time and again, and through them to try to figure out uh, what kind of tradition we have here. And I probably would put it, this book as an attempt to go beyond the crude positivism but without falling into ideology. So this is the space that I read the book. It's an attempt to be beyond positivism, crude positivism, that it's all verifiable by facts, but without lit reason going astray into the realm of metaphysics and ideology, um, illusory dialectics. What are the three themes that I want to address very shortly? One is the theme that really recurrent is the theme of putting together 
the theme of intersectionality, interdependence, and the word, God forbid, synthesis, which is very much recurrent. This idea of putting together. The second is the name of the book, which is Evolution Instead of Revolution, and what does that entail? And these two together, actually, um, brings us to the third key word in the whole book, I think, and which I do believe that they come out from these first two, is the idea of responsibility. The idea of responsibility that is connected to the idea of, after all, we are still free agent and we are not in the hand of the machine rule followers all the way down, we still can regain some agency even in the field of um, science, before science, during science, and after science. So this, this is the big picture. Now I just want to say a few words. Uh, so the first thing is, is, is really that Jürgen suggests that science is a part of a larger whole, which is knowledge and that knowledge is a part of a larger whole, which is society. Uh, not to speak that he wants to connect different kinds of knowledges, different kinds of sciences. So there's a clear attempt to putting things together instead of putting things apart. Now it's interesting to think and to reflect about this idea of synthesis, given that much of uh, the basis of modern science since the 17th century is based on the idea of divide and rule. Divide and rule means reason should divide problems into its basic components in order to be able to penetrate them. We don't face things as just overall phenomena. We should, like discourse in Methods in Descartes, we should divide the problem into smaller, smaller problems. So this is one thing to think about synthesis as to think how this is related to the whole procedure of knowledge that is analytical, putting things apart instead of putting them uh, together. When the synthesis does come in the process of knowledge before knowledge or after knowledge, etc. Uh, clearly, despite the fact that science is in society, in science connected to knowledge and knowledge to society, uh, still, they are differentiated. And this is playfulness, or this, at the same time, desire to differentiate, or to separate, and then to put together, I think it is one of the major themes that leads us to the idea of uh, responsibility. The second point is the whole idea of revolution and evolution. Now, I read probably too much into that. Probably uh, Jürgen didn't plan to do that. But for me, the idea of revolution is by necessary having an idea of basic structure and an idea of before and after that bears qualitative difference between what was before and what came after. So there is a certain idea of dichotomies built in the idea of revolution. Because the what comes after must be qualitatively different from came before. And in this sense, the idea of revolution um, presupposes dichotomies, cleanness, clarity, neatness, and binaries. And one of the moves in critical theory, in the history of critical theory, is questioning this idea of binaries. Uh, in the sense of nesting. Nesting is the persistence of the kind of problem or the dirt that you thought you have already cleansed. By making distinctions, you find it ahead of you and you thought you got rid of it. So there's always some element of myth in science as there's more science in myth and there's something secular in uh, uh, religion and something always religious in the secular. When you view things in this way, then you get rid of the idea of revolution as sort of complete replacing of one clear structure with another clear structure. And from here to the idea of evolution is more <coughs> 
unthinkable, and then you see why um, responsibility should come in, because it becomes more of a matter of judgment, because it's a matter of spectrum. It's not either or. And when things are not either or, uh, reason and logic cannot and are not able to do the work for us because we have all the time to think in terms of what we should do and now. Now, the third theme, which is, comes from the first two, clearly, is the theme of, uh, I have five minutes just to is the theme of responsibility, which is pretty much comes time again in, in the book, um, which for me, it is the kind of persistence of practical reason over theoretical reason. Of the question what we ought to do and each and every time um, as against the question of what we uh, can know. In this sense, there is a persistence of residue of thought. Residue of thought that is before, during, and uh, after the scientific activity itself. Now, I want to put this into uh, some historical context uh, and to see where where this can uh, can lead us. And probably, given the fact that I'm a hammer and all I see is nails, um, and I, I just finished my text on Kant, so I probably would start from Kant and then move to Arendt, because I think there's a line, Arendt, Kant, Arendt, and uh, the last point would be Edward Said uh, in this trajectory. Uh, I could take and have taken someone else, definitely. Because I think there is a line connecting these three in the sense of trying to salvage something about the whole idea of the humanities. What is there remains after positivism? What is there remain after the idea of that we can build science and knowledge on the idea of experience? Is everything said after knowledge based on science is just mere poetry, illusions, or what, or ideology? Is there a third space beyond positivistic knowledge but less than religion or mere ideology? And what is that kind of a third place? So I take the three of them, Kant in his own way, Hannah Arendt and Edward Said, as trying to free this space. And freeing this space is always dangerous, as Kant have already um, cautioned us that um, reason can really go astray into all kind of illusion, ideologies, transcendental nonsense, if you want. This is not his terminology. Now, Kant did make the distinction between uh, knowledge or cognition, or what we can know by experience, that reason can know by experience, and what's beyond that, what beyond Reason doesn't stop at the moment of cognition of knowledge, uh, but it can go um, astray. And it's, I, I don't have here to uh, say much about uh, Kant, uh, a phrase that I found myself have to put limits to knowledge in order to make room for faith. But I would start from this in order to see the way Hannah Arendt has appropriated Kant in limiting uh, knowledge, the realm of knowledge, in order to make room for faith. Arendt in her paper on thinking and moral consideration really reads Kant, and she claims that actually what Kant meant to say is that I have to put limits to knowledge in order to make room for thinking. So faith in Kant become thinking in Arendt. Now, what is thinking? This is exactly the interesting question um, that probably filling this word with meaning can be the answer to my um, first question about this third space that is beyond knowledge, but it's probably less than um, ideology or less than uh, religion. And for Arendt, um, we cannot resist 
this persistence of thinking as an activity beyond knowledge and beyond uh, cognition. And by its nature, uh, thinking is restless. It doesn't know any uh, moment to rest. And it's resultless. It doesn't produce anything. And that's why the humanity is always under attack, because we are completely resultless in the sense that whenever you stop thinking, you can't wake up the next morning. You said, oh, OK, I thought about that. That's enough. Because the minute where you stop, it's always there's a new beginning that actually, like the wind in Socrates, it always destroys what you have already managed to think. So there's always endless a new investigation and a new, uh, a new beginning um, in this sense. Now, of course, the other use of reason, in the strict sense at least, is that the frustration of knowing uh, freedom, immortality, God, is that the frustration with this energy is directed through the field of uh, morality. Now, morality or the ethical demands are put on us um, are not statement about us. They are not a report about the way the world is, about human nature. They are simply addressed to us. They are not about us. Now, this being addressed to us um, exactly uh, testifies to the centrality of practical reason that uh, we have a responsibility to act according to a certain uh, code or ethical or moral uh, uh, demands. Now, someone listening to me might, might think that um, here there's a phrase of going back to the old metaphysics. And thanks God we got rid of uh, metaphysics. And because to go beyond science, beyond the verification of experience, um, and this idea of responsibility, this idea that science is in society, that this idea that, oh, there are always social and political uh, consequences of science might seduce us to think that it's all the way down political. And to think that it's all the way down political means to strip the autonomy of science or to strip for other purposes even the autonomy of uh, probably aesthetics <coughs> or any other field because all fields are subject to one colonial field. It could be the political, but it could be the moral. Morality in itself sometimes can act as a colonial and try to impose itself. The whole idea of right, of having a right, instead of doing the right thing, presupposes that we have the freedom to do wrong. And so morality is very much aware that it's parts of morality that morality should put limits on it it's in itself by not imposing itself all the way down. So the idea of discipline of morality in itself, not imposing itself, is part of morality, which creates a paradox. But we come to life. It's the same as our relation to our children. Sometimes we know what's the right thing to do, but we know that they have the right to make their own mistakes. And we just hope that by practicing by their right to make mistakes, they reach the right conclusion, but we should be able to withhold our judgment and imposing it. Why do I say that? Because there are two dangers, not one danger. There's one danger of over-positivism, that things in terms of the machine, that science can run everything, can give us the answers to any question that we face. This is the fear that faced lots of philosophers at the beginning of the 20th century, each giving its different solution from Carl Schmitt to Arendt, Lolo, Strauss, and others. On the other hand, we know the other danger. The other danger is coming from those who know too much 
if experts knew probably too little or claim to know too little, saying, look, I'm in my laboratory, I'm giving answers to concrete questions. We have, on the other hand, those who only look at the overall context, claiming to know the overall context and the progress of history and can give us every answer about every question any time because they see the overall trajectory of history and thus subjugating the different need for different judgments in the different sphere, aesthetics, economy, politics, into one big judgment because they know the cunning of reason in history and they proclaim to represent it. And this is probably the danger that from Karl Popper before and after uh, and Arendt as well um, have warned us against. And probably the first one who knew it all was Kant that was very much aware that someone can take the dialectic of reason seriously and claim to know the trajectory of history. So we have two things to fear. One is the machine of positivism. The other is the overarching ideology that tell us that can give dictates to the scientists what should the result be in order to promote progress or socialism or Nazism or whatever you, uh, you name it. Now, yeah, one minute, just one minute. Now, as a historian of science who knew the fate of uh, Galileo, I'm sure that Jürgen uh, wasn't intending to tell us that it's all the way down ideology or all the way down uh, politics. But at the same time, um, he made us aware to the idea of responsibility. And he didn't give us any blueprint of how to deal with this tension and these paradoxes giving back, throwing the ball to us in order to be aware that our hands at least should tremble either way. If we want to cling only to professionals, that might be a problem. And if we want to succumb to the wings of politicians, that might be a problem as well. There's no escape from responsibility. <laughs>